Well, let's do a little catching up from this last week's reading. Jeremiah's call. Young kid, maybe, con- I told the confirmation kids, this is like you being called to be a prophet. 14, 15 years old? Yeah. Uncertain future. But God let him know that he was with him every step of the way. I'll put words in your mouth so you know what to say. I wish that were true for me, too. God pleased with Israel to repent. Of course, God is keeping asking, you know, you remember what it was like when you were in, your ancestors were in the desert wandering around and I was with them and I was leading them out and the golden days of that and, and all those kinds of things. And why have you forgotten God? Why have you forgotten me? He's kind of confused a little bit. And then you've got unfaithful Israel, Jeremiah 3, and God is describing himself as wife. You know, have you, you, know, have you uh, forgotten about your wife? Well, I hope not, you know. But, you know, you can't go back now. It's going to be different. You can't go back to your wife the way it was because you've already left. You know, so things are going to have to be different. Uh, you screwed it up, or so it seems. Restoration promise for Israel and Judah. Now, this is Jeremiah 30. We jump from 3 to 30. God declares that the beloved people of Israel and Judah still will be saved and, and there will be rescue there for them. God sees the pain of the people, wishes, them, wishes to free them. Why? Because God loves them. In every case, God is standing be- beside God's people to save them and rescue them from whatever oppression they face. And then a new covenant. Famous. This is the most famous part of Jeremiah. Like, not like the old covenant. The one that, that God's going to write on your hearts and that you'll want it to say because you'll, you'll know the spirit inside of you. There's several quoted quotes in the New Testament. Luke 20, 22, 20. 1 Corinthians 11, uh, 2 Corinthians 3, Hebrews, and 2 Corinthians. There's several uh, sayings about a new covenant with God's people. So that brings us up to today. The fiery furnace of Daniel, as we read this morning. Well, the fiery furnace. There's a lot of themes that go along in here. But I'm going to play the role of one of the chief administrators, one of the witnesses, one of the Chaldeans that made this whole thing happen because as far as I'm concerned, if you're living in my country, you have to worship my gods. And plus, the king, Nebuchadnezzar, said, once you hear one of these musical instruments, you better stop what you're doing right now and bow to this 90-foot statue. Let me see, 90 foot by 9 feet. That would be pretty, I can't imagine, but made out of gold? If you read earlier in Daniel that, you know, he had a, Nebuchadnezzar had a dream about a, a golden statue, right? So anyway, as far as I'm concerned, these Jewish, Jewish people ought to just shape up. We ought to be worshiping the same God, this thing, whatever we say. Like Pavlov's dog, as soon as, soon as you hear the bell, fall down on her knees and start worshiping this statue. Yeah, I know, it's like, it's like uh, trying to worship the Bears when you're a Packers fan, but hey, you know, you can change and grow, can't you? Maybe not. Maybe the best is to be a Packer fan and not worry about the Bears. Maybe it's best to be a child of God and worship God instead of worrying about these other things. These Jews were adamant, especially these three, Shadrach, Meshach, and Beg- You know, I was one that helped train them because Nebuchadnezzar saw something in them. They could speak the language, they're young, they're impressionable, we could train them the way we wanted to. They could be very useful for us in our kingdom here. Even though they're Jewish, we can still kind of transform them to be Babylonian type people. Well, yeah, that, that didn't go. It went like a lead balloon. And we had lead balloons back there. We didn't have plastic or rubber, so we had lead. We didn't have helium either, but that's beside the point. So anyway, these three wouldn't bend. I mean, they were in charge of a lot of people. What does that say about their leadership? And what does it say about how they're going to affect other people whom they lead? What kind of an example do they set for their own people, the Jewish people? If they're not bowing down, we're going to have complete anarchy. So we better make an example of these three. After all, Nebuchadnezzar said, if you don't bow down... So, first thing I did is I took 
I took them right to Nebuchadnezzar and said, hey, you made, you made the mandate, these three right here, you know them, because you picked them out a couple of years ago to be your you know, servants and your leaders, they're not bowing down, they're not obeying whatever you decreed. Now you said, if they don't, certain death, right? Well, then Nebuchadnezzar kind of hands, <clears throat> well, uh, yeah, uh, and he, he made, try to make provisions for these three. You know, if, if, if you bow down now, please, 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 then we'll have to kill you in the furnace, please, please, please. You could see him getting angry by the minute because these three, these three young men just stood there, just stood there, like nothing was happening. Like, oh, well, you know, I would be scared out of my pants if I knew I was going to go into this furnace. They seem to have no fear whatsoever. Something's going on with these three. Something's going on with the faith that these three have. I haven't felt that ever. And I've got this 90-foot statue. I mean, this is huge. This is made out of gold. This is precious metal, right? Of course, when you think about it, gold is kind of a soft metal. I don't think it could support 90 feet. Anyway, but anyway, I can't understand how these guys are so at peace with themselves. Why, is it, why aren't they afraid? I mean, everybody else we've brought in and thrown in the furnace has been scared to the death. Even when Nebuchadnezzar said, turn the furnace up, rake some more wooden stone, make it seven times hotter, the normal. I'm going to make an example of these three. They're going to bow down or else. And they're going to be an example. Every one of those Jews out there publicly, that this is what happens to you if you disobey my mandate. I watched as the guy threw in more and more wood, faster and faster and faster, and I could see the glowing becoming brighter. The outside of the furnace, you could feel the heat radiating from it. And then I was just floored when I saw them open the door for the furnace and the men that had bound them got so hot that they died right away from the heat and the flames of the fire. Looks like Nebuchadnezzar's plan backfired a bit at first notice because I didn't see these three getting harmed at all even when they got thrown into the furnace. And then I heard the Nebuchadnezzar jump up in complete astonishment and perhaps horror in some respect. He said, look inside here. Look. I thought there were three people in there. I thought we had three people in there. What's going on around here? And so we all looked from a distance because it was still pretty hot. We looked, and yeah, I, we could see four people in there. They're unbound, and they didn't have anything wrong with them. How did this fourth person get it? Who, who is that? Nebuchadnezzar said, it must, must be an angel. So he called him out and talked to him. And, and I, I couldn't believe it. This, this heat was so intense. It burned my eyebrows off just to look from a distance. It singed the hair off my arms. It's like a campfire. And I smell like smoke, like a sausage. And they were unblemished, nothing. No smoke smell, no hair burn, no clothes fried, nothing. This is a complete miracle. And then I started to think, what? There must be something with this, with this God, because we heard them say something about God delivering them from the hand of the furnace. But we thought, yeah, everybody says that. Every God that come to man, whether it be the God of the Jews or the God of Babel, whatever, have said, oh, please deliver me. But this one did. And Nebuchadnezzar was floored as well. He didn't know what to believe. First of all, a while back, Daniel interpreted his dreams and everybody else couldn't do it. So he was a little bit confused about this God of the Israelites, the Jews. What's going on here? Now, this kind of clinches the deal because then afterwards, he says, anybody who disses their God in any way will be thrown into this fire, fiery furnace. Whoa, that's a reversal. What about the statue? Well, nothing more is said about the statue. I guess Nebuchadnezzar was having both. I don't know. Ring the bells. You can bow to the statue or not, because if you, if you worship the God of these three and Daniel, then you're exempt from my proclamation. 
you know, later on we see that Nebuchadnezzar kind of, in a way, sort of converts in a little bit. But we also see that Nebuchadnezzar is still up to his old games. I mean, his, his allegiance to a god has changed, but nothing has changed within Nebuchadnezzar. He's still brutal. He still uses force to make people believe what he thinks they should believe. And nothing has really changed. But the thing that still sticks in my mind and I can't get out of it is the complete lack of fear on the part of these three men before they went into the fire. What is up with that? I mean, they didn't put up a fight at all. And then to see their God rescue them simply by walking with them in, in the fiery furnace. Simply walking, simply being there with them. Their God wasn't blowing the furnace up. Their God wasn't destroying the, the, the shrine, the, the statue. The, their God wasn't destroying the armies of Nebuchadnezzar. Their God was simply walking with them and being present with them in their worst moment of their lives in this fiery furnace. And i got to tell you, there have been, in my own life, times where the fiery furnace, the flames, have almost engulfed me. Points of complete depression and withdrawal. And we see that their God was right there with them. Not only protecting them, but keeping them company. Now later on, it'll be said that there will be a person coming years and years down the road who will be a Jew? Who will be with the people? Who will be a child? Who will be fearless? Who will be asking people to fear not? Who will be saying the presence of God is with you now? Who will heal? Who will include those who are outside the realm? Now this is one of the prophets that told me about this. And so I know. And this person, when he dies, before he dies, will say that there will be someone with you always. Something about an advocate that won't let you down. That even though you walk in your own fiery furnaces, even though you feel like you can't hold on, you can't keep going, there will be a presence with you, walking with you. And it's not one to destroy countries and nations, it's one to be with you. And I think throughout our kingdom and the Babylonian kingdom, that's more realistic than the battles. We don't fight many battles. We conquer and then we pretty much just live our lives. And I can see from these three that what's more normal for them is the presence of God in their daily lives when they're going about their business. You can see those people that are Jews, something about them. It just says peace. Something about him says they have a long history, a long tradition of a faith with a God who never lets them down. That they've been through the fires before. Their ancestors have been through the fires before, but have come through it. I don't see any resistance on their part. Maybe that's something new that we as a country need to learn. The Babylonian country, the Assyrians, the, the Romans, whomever, whatever empire needs to learn that it's this non-resistance, this fearless kind of way of, of working around things without raising swords. Because it worked to change the mind of a brutal ruler named Nebuchadnezzar. Interesting. Interesting. I'll never forget that. I'll never forget that day. For some reason, something inside me has just changed a bit. I've seen a different way that life is. Seeing a different way that God can be in our lives. Perhaps war is not the way. But like these three, steadfast faithfulness to their God who is with them day to day. Maybe that's the answer. Maybe that's the way we should be part of this family. This family of God. Well, that's, that's my reflections on the whole thing. It's been an, it's been an up uphill, downhill, it's been a roller coaster ride emotionally, spiritually for me as my older associates who were there witnessing the same thing all of us, leaders governors people in powerful places all saw the same thing and we talked afterwards and we say there's something that we're missing currently in our lives that these three have 
and we want to know more what's going on over there. The door has been opened in more ways than one. The furnace has been opened. Our hearts have been opened. And God who walks with them, maybe God walks with us as well, through our lives. 